very warm welcome to my dear students this is part 2 of our lesson on understanding the law therefore it's very important for you to watch part 1 of this lesson before you watch part 2 in part 1 we've discussed some basic concepts that would help you understand the law and in this video we'll go a little further while trying to attempt interpreting a statute as well as trying to read a judgment let's get into the lesson you might recollect from our previous video the part 1 that laws consist not just of the statutes which means laws are not just the legislations but also include judgments as well as customs and practices so when you talk of laws you are using a very wide term when i say it's wide it because it includes many things it includes it includes statutes it includes judgments and it includes customs and practices i will now discuss this term codification of laws take a moment to think as to what it might mean well codification basically is the process whereby something is codified i know that doesn't give you any meaning but when we codify something it basically means that we have written it down so you can think of codification as a process whereby there is a legislation which means someone is legislating and you make a legislation which means you bring it in writing you see a custom which was there previously so we saw that customs are also law now a custom is a kind of law as long as it is not codified which means as long as it is not written down by the law the moment it is written down and it becomes a part of an act this is what i mean by act act with a capital a which means the moment it becomes a part of a legislation or it becomes a part of a statute then you no longer see it as a custom because now this has been codified so i hope you get the point when you bring something in writing by way of a legislation that process is called codification right so we understand that codification is the process of making a legislation out of a law which was not written like a custom right and this process of writing it down the process of making this legislation is what is known as drafting obviously it is legislative drafting right which means a person has to draft the legislation now why am i discussing this with you you see this technique of legislative drafting is one that requires a lot of skill to understand this let's look at this little diagram you see the process of codification basically means that there is a certain law somewhere which is presently not written which means it is unwritten and now you want to write it down okay you want to write it down as a statute that is what exactly codification means something is unwritten but you want that to be written down so that one can see it so that you know that there is a certain section number so you call that codification the process of codification always begins with a sentiment what do i mean by sentiment there's a certain feeling of what is right of what is wrong a certain sentiment of what should be the law of what should not be the law definitely something starts from there so this is like the starting point okay thereafter what you do is that you decide to start writing it carefully you frame it carefully you draft it carefully you write it carefully now i have been saying that draftsmanship or legislative drafting is a very important skill let me tell you why let us say you have a certain sentiment okay but you don't draft it carefully enough you know what that means it means you would have loopholes you must have heard this word loopholes in the law you must have heard this loopholes in the law often arise because the drafting 
has not been careful you know what that means it means that despite following the law you're following the law yet you're able to do something bad because you've been able to find a loophole so the skill of drafting lies in being able to frame it so carefully that there are no loopholes okay so we just learned that the process of codification which means the process of writing down a law and making it a statute starts obviously with recognizing a sentiment thereafter you frame it carefully by putting it into words after that this is the job that has been done by the draftsman sorry draftsman this is spelling mistake let me just correct that this has been done by a draftsman okay and he's uh, adept he's skilled in what is known as draftsmanship it's a very important skill so the people who write the laws are those who understand grammar who understand the law they're very well read people very skilled people they know how to make precise definitions they know how to make precise provisions thereafter it has to receive approval from the parliament because as you know i have told you that the legislature the parliament is the legislature right i taught that in the previous lesson the legislature is the one who approves the legislation so the legislature is the parliament the parliament approves the legislation and then the law gets enacted and at this point you can say the law is codified very simple you start off with a certain sentiment that we believe that okay this should be a part of the law so what do you do you take a concept an abstract concept and give it some words but you must give those words carefully so it is done by a draftsman goes for approval to the parliament if it is approved the law is enacted so we understand the process of codification i spoke about this word sentiment now sentiment means something like a feeling it also connotes a bit of an opinion where do you get these sentiments from you get the sentiment perhaps from your conscience perhaps you get this sentiment from what you've learned there are various sources which determine what your sentiments would be and it is important for us to know that the law embodies these sentiments or at least the law is required to embody these sentiments so i can say in a way that the law embodies sentiments right what kind of sentiments the sentiments of the collective of all of us together so we all have sentiments the law perhaps embodies these sentiments let me give you a few examples let's say we have a certain sentiment the sentiment is that you know we should not kill another person it is bad okay so we kind of feel it's sad for someone to to go about killing somebody it's a bad thing to do so what do we have we have a law for this right we have a law the law that prohibits murder well it doesn't prohibit murder it actually punishes murder but you get the point there's a sentiment and the sentiment leads to the enactment of a law let me give you another example the sentiment is do not lie okay it's not good to lie from here you get a few laws for example let us say you have the indian contract act it says that okay if you've promised somebody something fulfill your promise this is a sentiment the sentiment results in a law let's think of it in another way do not lie it is bad you have the offense of cheating in the indian penal code it's an offense you might have heard of this 420 everyone talks of 420 okay so you know section 420 right so cheating is a, is a kind of is a kind of lie it is bad don't do it we get the sentiment let us say there might be some milder things which don't necessarily come from your conscience for example you you don't necessarily feel it's bad to drive without a helmet 
but then you realize that it is dangerous this is also a sentiment right and this results in a law what is the law that if you drive or if you ride a motorcycle without a helmet what happens to you you are fine for today's session i will be taking the laws related to homosexuality to understand our point right so when we talk about gay and lesbian relationships obviously there exists a sentiment in the society right and the law has to reflect that sentiment also you realize that the sentiments of different people are different right everybody has a different sentiment about perhaps the same thing so when you talk specifically say about gay and lesbian relationships or about homosexuality then everyone has a different sentiment so what does the law do what does the law do when there are sentiments which vary depending on the person how does the law resolve such such discrepancies how does the law resolve such divergence of opinion such divergence of sentiments you must also be aware of the fact since it was in the news around 2 years ago that there is a supreme court judgment on this subject of gay and lesbian relationships the lgbtq community and the relationships between them you know that there are very different opinions there are very diverse opinions and the supreme court had pronounced a judgment on this matter now i want to ask you something i had said a little while back when i showed you the arrow and the flow chart that you always start with a sentiment and the sentiment perhaps later becomes the law so now what is the law for this where is the law for the sentiment how do you start to locate the law in this video we are trying to understand the law right how do we understand the law how do we find the law how do we interpret the law that's what we are doing in this video so the question is where is the law simple go for a google search now have a look at what i have done in the google search bar if you notice i have in fact even made a typographical error here i must confess that i didn't do this on purpose but then you realize that even if you don't know it fully perhaps you did not know that it is lgbtq and so you perhaps just wrote lqbt like i did you don't know it but google will give you a suggestion it says okay lgbt law all right it has now brought you on track you you started off with perhaps no knowledge whatsoever now you have some knowledge okay i'm telling you as to how you progress in understanding the law so now you look at the first link the first link is a wikipedia link so perhaps we could just go ahead and click on this wikipedia link let's go ahead so this is the first link that i clicked on right so it's very simple i went first for a google search after the google search i clicked on the first link and this is where we are right now let us see what this first link offers us okay the first thing it tells you is what the full form of lgbt is okay and it tells you about some some social difficulties okay and then you can see that there are some something written here it tells you the number of transgender people in india and then finally you get down to this paragraph take a moment to have a look at this you will see that it gives you the lead that you need it says here that in 2018 the supreme court of india decriminalized consensual homosexual intercourse by reading down 377 of the ipc okay it looks like we found our law 377 of the indian penal code okay so let's do one thing let us go and see as to what 377 is you know how i went here 
I went here simply by clicking on the hyperlink within Wikipedia. So I've not yet left Wikipedia. I'm just illustrating to you as to how you can start. There are several ways in which you can start. I'm just showing you one method. You go type something that you know on Google. Google will suggest you something, click on it, then click on something else, click on something else. And eventually the story will unfold. So that's what I'm doing. I clicked on 377 within Wikipedia and now we are here. So it says that 377 of the Indian Penal Code was introduced in 1861 during the British rule of India. Okay. Modeled on the Buggery Act of 1533. Okay. It makes sexual activities against the order of nature illegal. It makes a mention of the Supreme Court judgment on 6th of September 2018 that the application of 377 to consensual intercourse between adults was unconstitutional. We've discussed this word already, the word unconstitutional. So we, we, we know that there is the need sometimes to check the constitutionality of laws. I have discussed this in the previous part. In case you've not watched it, make sure you go back, watch that part and then get back here. Okay, so it talks about 377. Then this paragraph goes ahead to say something about portions of the section were first struck down. I've explained as to what the meaning of struck down is also in the first part. With respect to gay sex by the Delhi High Court in July 2009, it was overturned by the Supreme Court in Suresh Kumar Kaushal versus Nas Foundation in 2013. Well, this is starting to get a little complicated here. On August 2000. In August 2017, it talks of the Puttaswami judgment. January 2018, it says it hears a petition. So you can see that it is starting to get a little complex here. Now, either you can fight this, you can work here, try to understand this, click on each of these hyperlinks and get back. That's one way of doing it. Or perhaps if you feel this was getting too hard, let's look for a simpler way of doing this. There are so many things to read. What do you pick? What do you read from? Well, this is what you have to decide. There is a way in which you can go around wading your way in the waters and finding something to do. But I will give you some guidelines on what the sources of law are. I have told you already that there are two sources of law, the primary sources and the secondary sources. The primary sources of law are the more are the more reliable and authoritative sources these are the authoritative sources of law the secondary sources of law are less authoritative okay so preferably you should be learning the law from primary sources by the way, the Wikipedia page that we were just seeing was a secondary source of law. I'll explain this to you a bit more. There are only two primary sources of law. Okay. The first is the statutes. So for example, section 377 of the IPC is a provision of the statute that is primary good likewise judgments you saw the names of many judgments somebody versus somebody the court ruled in somebody versus somebody all of these are judgments judgments are also primary sources of law these are the only two sources which are primary and these are the authoritative sources of law right you can think of these as being the original sources of the law also and therefore they are the most reliable okay now if you noticed when we saw the little paragraph in wikipedia we saw the list of many judgments we saw navtej singh johar then we saw Suresh Kaushal, 
then we saw the name putta swami you saw a judgment by the delhi high court then you saw a supreme court judgment of 2009 well 2013 not 2013 is written wrong this is so you saw supreme court judgment of 2013 you saw supreme court judgment of 2018 which one do you choose out of all of these options now when you choose a judgment you make your judgment based on a few factors the first is based on the hierarchy of the court i had discussed the hierarchy of courts with you in the previous video as you know you have the supreme court at the top below that you have the high court and below that let me say you have some lower courts okay try to choose the judgment of the supreme court if you do not find a supreme court judgment try to find a judgment of the high court okay so it's important for you to choose the judgment of the highest possible court why is that it is because the supreme court has the power to overturn the decision of a high court the high court has the power to overturn the decision of a lower court also the decision of the supreme court a decision of the supreme court is binding what is the meaning of binding it means it is mandatory okay it is binding on all other courts so if the supreme court says something supreme court says this is right then this becomes the law this becomes the law of the land therefore it's very important for you when you're choosing your judgment to identify the hierarchy of the court okay what is the next parameter when you when you're on these crossroads of which judgment to choose look at the size of the bench now the supreme court sometimes many times does not sit as one judge instead it sits as a bench and i'll explain the concept of a bench to you in the previous video part 1 so what you should know is that a larger bench a larger bench of judges gives you a more authoritative decision so if you have a larger set a larger bench then you should go for the larger bench also suppose the the size of the bench is the same the court is the same then what is another factor that you could possibly see you could see how recent the judgment is how 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 near in the future in, in the past it was so the more recent a judgment the more relevant it is to summarize try to go for a supreme court decision because the supreme court is higher up the hierarchy than the high court or the low courts then try to go for the largest possible bench because a larger bench can overturn the decision of a smaller bench also go for a new judgment a recent judgment if something let's say there's a judgment that has happened in 2019 let's say there's a high court judgment of 2019 and there is another high court judgment of 2000 say 11 okay then perhaps the judgment of 2019 is a better choice okay so we were talking about primary sources and secondary sources i was just explaining to you in primary sources that on the one hand you have the statute and on the other you have the judgment and i told you how to choose the judgment okay now let's talk about the second resources of if you read a book let's say somebody writes a book on the indian penal code or somebody writes a book on the constitution okay that is a secondary source of law similarly some books are commentaries okay commentaries are also words that we use for books somebody could write a commentary again on the ipc on the constitution on contract company law or whatever it's a secondary source of law what else 
someone could write an article, like the article that we see on Wikipedia for example. Or it could be an article that is there on a blog. They are telling you the law, it's a source of law, but these are secondary sources of law. And I will show that to you in a little while, we'll see that in some detail uh, as we progress in this lesson. You could also read what are known as digests. So you have these monthly digests, you have some weekly digests, annual digests. These are also some other sources from where you can know the law. In fact, even this lecture is a source of law. Perhaps you're learning a bit if you're watching it. If you watch this, of course, if you don't watch it, it is, it is not a source of law. But in case you watch this lecture, this lecture is also a secondary source of law. And this lecture, like with other secondary sources of law, does not have as much authority as the primary sources. However, having said that, there is the difference between a good book and a bad book, a good commentary and a bad commentary, that there's a difference between, well, a good lecture and a bad lecture as well. So when you compare a good lecture with a bad lecture or a good commentary with a bad commentary, then good books, good lectures, good articles, good digests are more reliable than some bad ones. And how do you identify a good book from a, how do you identify a good book? How do you identify a good commentary? Well, there are ways of doing that. See the publisher see whether it has been published in a reputed journal, see whether it has been published um, uh, in, in a good uh, publishing house, in a, in a good magazine, in a good reputed digest and so on, right? If it's a lecture, then perhaps you can have a look at the university. Is the university credible? So you, you always look at the credibility of the, you always check the credibility of a secondary source of law. You check the credibility. So don't pick up random articles. Don't read random books. If the book is bad, it's possible that you might learn the law incorrectly. So this is what I wanted to say about secondary sources of law. You should be a little careful when dealing with secondary sources of law. So to summarize how you pick your sources in your endeavor to understand the law. That's what we're doing here. We are trying to understand the law. What do you do? As far as the primary sources are concerned, you go for the statutes and you go for the Supreme Court judgment on the subject. The Supreme Court judgment on the subject is the most authoritative, so you go for that. You will realize as we progress into the lesson, however, that these are quite difficult to understand, right? These are a little technical and therefore secondary material is relatively easier to understand. So it will help you understand primary sources. Okay, so you should use secondary material in order to be able to better comprehend the primary material. So we start with our statute, the statute which is our primary source. We are identified from Wikipedia that we needed to know section 1377 of the IPC. The IPC is the Indian Penal Code. And you have this before you here. We've discussed this provision in the class as well. And as you can see, it talks about unnatural offenses, right? The title also is unnatural offenses. And then you see here, whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with imprisonment for either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall be also liable for fine. So what you can see from here is that this is where you realize that something is illegal. What is that illegal thing? That illegal thing is carnal intercourse. What is carnal intercourse? intercourse relating to flesh which basically means this is dealing with sexual intercourse. 
so when someone has sexual intercourse that goes against the order of nature okay that is when the it becomes an offense as far as this provision is concerned i want you to notice something do you see any mention of homosexuality do you see any mention of gay lesbian do you see homosexuality do you see lgbt you don't see any of this right that means definitely it has been interpreted it's a very important point for you to understand the only thing that you see here is something being against the order of nature right which means that when you look at the statute you can perhaps presume that the person who made this law and now we know how this law came into being it's very important and that's why when you understand the process you start learning things a little better somebody has written here against the order of nature okay he does not speak of homosexuality he does not speak specifically of lgbt he just says against the order of nature now there was a sentiment the sentiment was let us not have people engage in 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 intercourse that is against nature okay then what does he do he drafts it in a certain way when you draft it he says against the order of nature all right and then of course this becomes the law if you notice here the draftsmanship does not make a mention of lgbtq which means that we look at the intention of the draftsman or the intention of the legislature that's what we try to gather so we can see that when we see the statute perhaps the intention of or the sentiment of the legislature was that homosexuality is against the order of nature that's what you can understand from here homosexuality or rather homosexual intercourse not homosexuality it deals only with homosexual intercourse is against the order of nature and therefore you wanted to punish it like how you felt that that maybe murder was bad so you're punishing it theft is bad you're punishing it not wearing a helmet was bad you punish it homosexual intercourse let us punish it that is what you can gather when you see this particular provision let's go ahead as you can see there is the need for a contextual interpretation now why am i saying contextual interpretation that is because what the sentiment was why did they call it against the order of nature what is it about the society what is it about the the mind or the intention of those who framed the law that they believed that homosexual intercourse was against the order of nature why what is the context it is important for us to see all of these details you can't just look at this because as you can see this entire law is just one sentence and one sentence cannot tell you everything which means you require to understand the context if you remember in the class earlier i had told you that you have the law at the center right and i told you one little sentence it's that that sentence was that the law does not operate in vacuum i'll write that again for you the law does not operate in vacuum what that means is you always have to analyze the operation of the law in the light of its context so when you see the law you always look at the surrounding circumstances you look at the context and unless you understand the context you don't understand the law right so we have to see the context of the law in trying to understand the law in trying to understand the meaning of some words the ipc itself helps you for example 
there are some words that you will find in this provision in the statute in this particular provision 377 there are some words which have been defined in the ipc itself for example offense offense has been defined in section 40 of the ipc in case you are curious you can go and have a look at what i'm saying otherwise you can just watch the video as such similarly voluntarily is a word that has been defined in section 39 of the ipc right similarly man or woman man woman has been defined in section 10 of the ipc animal has been defined in section 47 of the ipc right now you understand that some of these words have been defined in the ipc but what about the other words how do you understand the meaning of other words for the other words we have to use their grammatical meaning like i said when you've codified a law when you've written down law essentially you are trying to make a grammatical sense of it so you will find that in order to understand the law you have the assistance of the law for some words for the others you need to go for a grammatical meaning however it is not possible for you to go simply for a plain grammatical meaning if i say you go for a plain grammatical and obvious meaning that may not always be right because it is important for the law to be interpreted like i said the black letter of the law is not sufficient it is not a comprehensive source of what the law is it requires to be interpreted and you might recollect that in the previous uh, session as well in the previous uh, video i had said that the supreme court or the courts in general what is the job of the court the duty of the court is to interpret the law let me remind you that we saw in the previous video that as far as the law is concerned we said that there were three pillars right of governance there were three pillars there were three pillars we said the first was the legislature the third was the the second was the executive and the third was the judiciary what were their roles the legislature makes the law in other words it enacts the law the executive implements the law and the judiciary primarily interprets the law right so that is the main task of the judiciary the main task of the judiciary is to interpret the law all right so now we want to know the interpretation of the law which means we want to look at what the supreme court has said or what the court has said so we want to know the name of the judgment so you simply write this on google you write section 377 supreme court judgment because we decided that we want to see the supreme court judgment because the supreme court judgment is the most significant the most relevant so as you can see here you have found the name of your judgment it says the name of the judgment is navtej singh johar versus the union of india if you remember i had told you in the previous video as well that the courts are here to address disputes which means that in every matter well almost every matter you would have two parties right and the supreme court decides the dispute so and during the course of deciding the dispute it writes a judgment 
right we discussed that they give their reasons for their decision and that is the judgment so now that we know the name of the judgment we write the name of the judgment in the search bar here now that leads me to a wikipedia link right let's just click on this wikipedia link and see what happens okay so as you can see here this is the wikipedia page on the navteth singh johar judgment you must remember that this is a secondary source right wikipedia is a secondary source this wikipedia article is a secondary source explaining the judgment and the judgment was a primary source okay so if you talk of how authoritative or how reliable this source is i'd have to say that its reliability and authority is a little low let me show you why do you see this button here you can edit this article you see anyone can go and perhaps decide to strike this off from here okay anyone can edit the article secondly who is the author of this article you don't know who has written this is the person who has written this credible well these are question marks and therefore you would you would have perhaps heard that wikipedia is not really accepted as a good source in academics right so if you want to write a paper or if you want to have some kind of publication it is not good or it is not advisable for you to be basing your research entirely on wikipedia but although wikipedia is not authoritative or reliable completely if you ask me whether it is useful my answer to this definitely is yes how does it help you it helps you explain the judgment it simplifies things for you and therefore what we do is we will even see what is written on wikipedia because it gives us some knowledge right so let's have a a brief look at what this wikipedia article has to tell us okay it tells you that navteth singh johar is a landmark decision a landmark decision means that it's a very important decision it determines the law so it's an important decision an important decision is called a landmark decision okay what happened in this case the court was asked to determine the constitutionality of 377 okay and then the verdict was hailed as a landmark decision for lgbt rights in india with campaigners waiting outside the court cheering after the verdict was pronounced elements of 377 relating to sex with minors non consensual acts such as rape bestiality remain in force now this isn't a very precise line there are a few technical glitches here if i might yet this line is informative if you want you can go click on this understand as to what this is you can go understand as to what this is and so on so you can use wikipedia and the hyperlinks in it to understand a few more things to enhance your knowledge i scroll down further in this wikipedia article and i get the background and as i said the context is very important because it is through this context that you start to understand the law remember here in this video we are trying to understand the law so to un for an understanding of the law we need the background okay so you can see something about a 2013 case you can see that there are some petitioners okay so now we know that navteth singh johar is a dancer there is a chef there is a journalist sunil mehra hoteliers and a business woman so these are the petitioners that means they had filed a writ petition in the supreme court which means that these people navteth singh johar keshav suri amarnath amannath all of these people went to the supreme court in 2016 okay 
they challenged the constitutionality of 377 and this is where a dispute arises right i always told you that when you go to the supreme court you go there because there's a dispute they said that of course they were aggrieved by the 377 and they said that it violated their fundamental rights okay so now this is what you understand as the background let's go a little further since this was getting a little difficult let's perhaps decide that we can go for something simpler so what i do is i just write on google navteet singh johar india union of india summary and then we've already seen this link because this is the wikipedia link let's go to the next link okay what i'm trusting here is google simple perhaps what shows up on google on the first page of google even if it's not entirely reliable it is definitely useful let's go ahead and click this this is what you see when you click this link okay it talks about the case summary and the outcome it says that the supreme court of india unanimously held that 377 was unconstitutional in so far as it criminalized consensual sexual conduct between adults of the same sex okay i told you what the meaning of unanimous was when you have a bench okay and if all of them agree it means it is unanimous go back to the previous video i have spoken about what a split decision is about what a majority judgment is who the dissenting judges are who the concurring judges are make sure you see all of that okay and then here you can see some of the facts okay it says the central issue of the case was the constitutional validity of 377 of the ipc in other words you are checking the constitutionality of 377 ipc okay we've seen what 377 was let's go ahead this again is from the same article i have just picked up a little screenshot it says the issue in the case originated in 2009 so it's taking you through the history okay in the delhi high court in the case of nas foundation versus the government of national capital territory of delhi so you see the supreme court case is navtej singh johar versus union of india the delhi high court case is nas foundation versus the government of delhi union of india basically means the government of india because this is the supreme court here in the delhi high court it is nas foundation versus government of delhi simple you had look at the history you're getting an idea of the context you're getting an idea of the story then it talks of a 2014 judgment of the supreme court which is called suresh kumar kaushal versus nas foundation overturned the delhi high court decision you remember i told you that suppose there is a decision of the high court this can be overturned by the supreme court what it can do is it can overturn this now what is the size of the bench this is a two judge bench as you can see here it's a two judge bench this is a two judge bench as you can see here okay now what happened in the case that we are presently seeing we had another supreme court decision but this time it was a five judge bench and the five judge bench overturned what the two judge bench said so now i hope you understand why i explained to you as to why we understand the hierarchy of the courts and the hierarchy of benches okay i want to draw your attention towards one point 
do you notice this thing here which says p11 para 9 these are referring to page numbers and paragraph numbers of what these are referring to the page and para of the actual judgment right remember what we are seeing right now is a secondary source of the law because we are seeing an article we are seeing something which has been written on the basis of the judgment so this is referring to that particular point in the judgment so what you see here this this phrase stamp of approval this phrase must have been taken in fact it has been taken from the judgment now this is a very important thing that I want you to know it is called citation you know what the meaning of citation is when you take something from somewhere you cite it which basically means you tell the source right you will see this happening ahead as well we scroll down further into this article okay so what you see are the arguments of the petitioner we know that there were five petitioners of six petitioners Navtej Singh Johar and a couple of others right but we are presently talking of only one person so he filed the writ petition he said that his fundamental right under article 21 was violated okay then he said that it violated his right under article 14 as you can see you can find this mentioned in the judgment okay take your time to read this it said that it was violative of article 15 okay article 15 which i have not discussed with you basically says that there shall be no discrimination on the grounds of sex amongst other things okay so there are many factors on which on the basis of caste sex etc religion place of birth so article 15 he says that was also violated his right under article 15 was violated okay then he said that his right under article 19 freedom of expression was also violated so basically you get the arguments of the petitioner the petitioner is saying that if you have a provision like 377 then that violates my fundamental rights under article 14 under article 15 under article 19 and article 21 to understand these search these things on google and you will get an idea of what these are also you can go and read them in the constitution of india itself you will get an idea these are very simple things you read a few articles here and there and you'll get it but i want to tell you a very important point now there is a very important principle in law okay this is latin so ignore the latin but do not ignore what is written in english here okay this is the translation of this latin phrase it, these these phrases are called maxims okay we call these legal maxims right so legal maxims are basically some of our principles of law and often they are there in latin okay i don't know why perhaps because it's a little fancy okay now here the other side it means it's a principle of natural justice remember this phrase now a principle of natural justice it means do not decide until you have heard the other side okay so it's important before arriving at your decision that you listen to what the others have to say so you've heard the petitioners you have heard Navtej Singh Johar do you have to hear the other side now of course you have to so when I am saying here you have the arguments that are raised against what was said by the petitioner so these have been raised by the respondent okay the respondent refers to the person who is responding okay the respondent was the Union of India okay but what you realize is that in this dispute of Navtej Singh Johar versus Union of India this article tells you 
that along with these people certain non governmental organizations religious bodies and other representative bodies also find applications to intervene in the case you get my point let me explain this to you it says that in this case apart from navdeep singh johar and the union of india there were some other people who joined as interveners okay so what they do is they intervene in this case as interveners and they also present their points before the court now what the union of india said was that it leaves it to the wisdom of the court it said okay the court can decide however there were some interveners like you saw the the interveners here people who intervene the interveners they argued against the petitioner and which is why we are seeing this they said that the right to privacy is not unbridled you know what this means I'll let me highlight this for you first they said the right to privacy is not unbridled you know what that means that you do not have an absolute right to privacy it is not an absolute right let me write that a little smaller so they said that you do not have an absolute right it is not absolute you cannot do anything that you want to in the name of privacy okay they also argued that such acts were derogatory to the constitutional concept of dignity so according to these people right according to the respondents not necessarily the respondents the interveners they said that these acts what do you mean by these acts these acts means the consensual intercourse between people of the same sex they said it is derogatory to the constitutional concept of dignity okay and they said such acts would increase the prevalence of hiv aids in the society okay and they said that if 377 is declared unconstitutional then that would trouble the institution of marriage and that may also violate article 25 you see article 25 is a fundamental right relating to religion now suppose somebody's religion says do not have a uh, consensual intercourse with same sex now the court says you can have consensual intercourse with the same sex so are you violating somebody's right to free, right relating to religion so this is what the contentions of the petitioners were so you heard the arguments of both sides and now look at what the court decided the five judge bench of the court unanimously decided that 377 in so far as it applies to consensual sexual conduct between adults in private was unconstitutional that means if the if it is consensual between adults and in private this is no longer punishable 377 is not applicable to these cases and therefore the court overruled its decision in suresh kaushal so as we know we had a high court decision in 2009 this was overturned by the supreme court overruled by the supreme court in 2014 by a two judge bench and this was in turn overturned by the supreme court in 2018 by a five judge bench it means that the supreme court decision is similar to this high court decision right so you get the idea of what happened now it's important for you to know as to how the court decides right you will find that in any given judgment so we are seeing navdeep singh johar versus union of india in any given judgment the court also looks at several other judgments so it looks at its own its own old judgments it looks at this judgment which it gave in 2014 it looks at its 2017 judgment 
here it sees its judgment of 2018 and so on so you can see that it relies on several old judgments make sure you read this paragraph the more you read the better okay so all of this this para 72 all of this these are the paragraphs in the Navtej Singh Johar judgment okay so you can see that in arriving at its decision it had to see a couple of other decisions of its and then finally it came to its conclusion also we saw this is a five judge bench let's have a look at the five judges chief justice mishra that's basically deepak mishra who spoke on behalf of himself and khanvilkar so that's one and two then you see what justice nariman said that's three what justice chandrachut said that's four what justice malhotra said that's five so you have what the five judges have said and and that pretty much sums up the decision so you have the judgments given by each of the uh, the judges and they were all unanimous which means they all agreed so all of them are basically saying in different ways through slightly different reasoning that 377 required to be struck off you can pause the video here and perhaps read this for a moment to get an idea of what is being said here now what we will do is we will see the actual supreme court judgment right this judgment here is the actual supreme court judgment like i said it's easier to see the commentaries as you can see this is a long document all of 495 pages right it's not easy seeing this but as you can see this is the judgment navjit singh johar versus union of india along with several other so now you can see we just saw that Deepak Mishra spoke for himself and Khanvilkar. Now their judgment has a contents page. As you can see, they have their contents A, B, C. Submissions on behalf of the petitioners, as you can see here, on behalf of the petitioners. Then it's on behalf of the respondents. Moving on, you will see several more things like perspective of human dignity, sexual orientation, Nas Foundation and Suresh Kaushal decisions, other pronouncements. It also talks of an international perspective in the United States, Canada. So like I said, it gives you all of these perspectives and it gives you a holistic view. Okay. And then it arrives at a conclusion. So now you can see it's begun with A, the introduction. It's starting here with A, introduction. And this is what you had here as well, A, the introduction. So as you can see, let's go back. The introduction here as you see here he kind of talks about John Stuart Mill it looks like there's something like poetry going on here in the introduction he talks of Shakespeare what's in a name well as you can see there's some amount of poetry and prose going around here doesn't seem to be talking too much about the law very strictly I scroll ahead I continue to see that well it appears to be a, a generic speech right I told you the other day that there is this thing that is called the orbiter and then there is this thing that's called the ratio the ratio is the main part and I said that with time you learn to identify what the main thing is now now what I see is there is a case that is spoken of so it kind of gathers my attention I I look at it it talks a bit about gender identity this is what has been said in a judgment the Nalsa judgment okay it talks about what the judge in that court in 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 that decision said okay so you can see that this is a very lengthy judgment and now as I scroll looking for material I kind of realize now that okay it looks like the story is over the Shakespeare is over and now we are we are in the midst of things so now I go and I you see I go for point number C if you remember point number C was the submissions on behalf of the petitioners right the petitioners 
we saw the summary of that but now let's see what's given in the judgment as to what the petitioners have to say so i scroll I scroll with time you learn how to scroll and look at things easily it says it's submitted on behalf of the petitioners that okay article 21 you found it you found article 21 okay now let's go ahead you also found article 19 right let's go ahead you will also find the contention that has been made about other provisions uh you find nalsa being spoken of i scrolled on further looking for any other arguments that one might find here you go it talks about 14 19 and 21 our golden triangle which i have explained to you already our golden triangle right so with this we pretty much understand that i also saw article 15 here you go article 15 is here so we've seen all of the provisions that we saw in the summary and which means that 14 15 19 21 we've got an idea of what has been said in this judgment because you see article 15 was also one of the provisions that we saw i'll scroll ahead now we've reached the submissions by the respondents this is what we had also seen when i said you should hear the other side so the interveners what do the interveners have to say okay so we saw that the union of india had left it to the wisdom of the court i know i'm going very fast pause the video don't worry it's you have the luxury of pausing the video scrolling ahead to show you that here you see undignified derogated to the constitutional concept of dignity you remember this we just spoke of this okay he speaks of constitutional immorality okay transgressing the concepts of public morality is the reasons that are being given then he also gives the reason that it con can cause aids right he also says that the family system could be spoiled the family system would be eroded so again you see that these are some of the contentions that have been made and this is a process that can go on you can you can see this for as long as you want to this is a very long judgment you scroll further ahead you will find more but then i will stop for the time being as far as this is concerned as you go ahead so we've just seen the judgment of deepak mishra and kanvilkar this is the first part for which you had all of these a b c d and all of these things thereafter you will have the judgment by the other judges amounting to a total of 495 pages right and these are the paragraph numbers 44 45 are the paragraph numbers you also have the page numbers now this must be leading to the question whether you should read the whole judgment or not is that needed is that possible well there is no such need to read the whole judgment the truth be told even i have not read the whole judgment because perhaps it is not needed and perhaps it is not even possible for someone to read all judgments completely having said that it is important to read at least a few judgments fully i would say you should read a few judgments fully perhaps this is a very long judgment so you could look for a smaller judgment something that goes around 50 to 100 pages these are relatively smaller judgments when you read one judgment then you learn a lot and thereafter you learn how to read judgments quickly So as far as this is concerned well there is no need especially in this case it's a very large judgment you don't need to read it you can you can just scroll through it and perhaps since now you are new to this you might not be able to find the important parts in it but like i reminded you the whole judgment is not important right there is only a part of the judgment that is the most important 
I had discussed this in the first video. The ratio decidendi, which I had discussed with you in the previous video, is what should be read. The rest of it, which is called the obiter dicta, like for example, he speaks of Shakespeare and all of that. Well, you don't necessarily need to read, read that. If you can read this, right, it's more than enough. So in this video, we had attempted to understand the law, interpret a statute, read a judgment. I hope that by the end of this video, you have progressed to some extent. You've managed to learn a bit. This is a process. The deeper you get into it, the better you will fare. As you can see, material is plentiful. There are various ways of doing it. I started off my Google search with a certain word. You could do something else. You could do something different. As long as it gets you to understand the law, we are doing fine. So to conclude, to enhance your understanding of the law, the more you read, the better it is. You should try to read primary sources of law, but the primary sources of law are sometimes long, especially the judgments. And sometimes they're not very easy to understand. So they're kind, kind of tough in order to explain these you can look at secondary sources. Sometimes secondary sources have good comments, right? Sometimes secondary sources also give you a lot of value. So read reliable sources of, reliable secondary sources of law. With time, you will come to know as to what is reliable and what is not. So I hope this lesson was of worth to you. You learned something and thank you for your patience. Good day.